Welcome everyone uh, to the Biodiversity Information Standards um, TED Week 2020 conference. This is uh, the panel discussion three, enabling digital specimen and extended specimen concepts in current tools and services. I am your moderator, Falko Löckler from the Natural History Museum in Berlin, Germany. My co-moderators and helpers are uh, Heimo Reiner, Mareike Petersen, Sabine von Mehring and Alex Hardesty. And we are grateful uh, for the technical support from Matthias Dillen, Quentin Groom and Brenda Daly. Uh, this session will be recorded for later viewing. So just some, some uh, information before we start. Um, we would like to collect your questions, preferably in a Google document that is linked here and um, in the chat. And um, this document will be also used uh, in order to continue the discussions um, as a basis um, in other formats. Um, if you use the chat for the questions, please highlight your questions by prepending the term slash question. Uh, to help the moderators better find um, your question amongst uh, other comments. Um, please use the chat appropriately um, for topics relevant to the discussion. Otherwise, we might remove you uh, from the virtual room and you will, will not be able to re-enter the room. Um, please see our code of conduct for more information. I would also like to ask you to mute your microphones and to turn off uh, your video so we can better distinguish the panelists um, and the uh, participants um, in our um, gallery of, um, of the participant list. Um, if you want to ask a question orally, please raise your virtual hand by using the respective button in the Zoom menu or simply write slash hand in the chat so we can better identify that you want to speak up. Um, please bear with any technical difficulties that we may have. And now I would like to welcome um, our panelists today. Uh, we try to invite um, a diverse panel with uh, respect to their expertise gender and geographical uh, um, region they come from. But as you might be aware, um, in this format, only limited space in the panel is feasible and not all invited panelists could follow our invitation um, and uh, are not available uh, today, unfortunately. But however, I'm convinced that um, this will be a fruitful discussion with, over, with the overarching goal to identify um, the major tasks and priorities regarding the transformation of tools uh, and services uh, from the perspective of collection data management, international data infrastructures, data usage inside and outside um, of the domain specific subject areas. So thank you all for joining us and uh, thanks to all the panelists again um, and now I hope you enjoy our session. You know, I would like to um, ask the panelists to be briefly introduce themselves. And I would like to hand over to Andrew Bentley. Hey everybody, my name is Andy Bentley. Um, I'm the Ichthyology Collection Manager and Bioinformatics Manager for the Biodiversity Institute at the University of Kansas. Um, as 25% of my job, I also work for the Specify Software Consortium um, as a usability consultant, um, trying to help them in terms of um, making Specify a more user-friendly package. Um, I am also the co-PI on the Biodiversity Collections Network, uh, NSF RCN, or uh, Research, Co Research Coordination Network Grant, um, that produced the Extended Specimen Network Report um, and I'm also a co-author on the um, National Academy of Sciences report about biological collections that was recently re released. Um, those two reports align very well together in terms of the, the recommendations that they, that they put forth. 
Um, and as the Biodiversity Collections Network, we are hoping to uh, move some of that work forward um, through a, a series of workshops um, and possibly another RCN um, to NSF um, in order to start looking at some of these things and trying to put together an implementation plan um, as to how we would actually move a lot of these um, a lot of these recommendations forward in the community. Thanks, Simon. Would you please introduce? Thanks, me? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Simon Chickfield. I'm the manager for digital collections and informatics at CSIRO, um, specifically in the National Research Collections Australia. Um, my role is around um, ensuring that our, our digitization of our legacy specimens um, from our analog to a digital format happens, as well as looking at our digital systems frameworks and uh, the management of our collections data and specimens, um, as well as a few smaller innovation programs in and around that. Um, I guess uh, for the purposes of this panel discussion, what, what I'm not is a scientist. I've spent the last 25 years primarily in uh, an IT role around enterprise information systems and architectures of those said systems and delivery of major corporate um, IT systems. And uh, what attracts me with this panel specifically is around things to deal with um, digital divergence and, and how we can deal with um, such issues within within the new frameworks that we might be looking at. Thanks. So, Debbie, would you sure. please go ahead? Hi, uh, my name is Deborah Paul, and I am currently the incoming chair for the Biodiversity Information Standards uh, Tadwig organization. And currently, I have a, a new role. Uh, as well with the Species File Group uh, at the Illinois Natural History Survey at the University of Illinois, where I am a biodiversity informatics community liaison and it's sort of a product manager idea that we are developing and it's a sort of local to global aspect to it. We're trying to uh, serve to bring the community together around, uh, for example, software development. And uh, I come after nine years with IDIC Bio as a digitization specialist and capacity development manager. Thanks. Wouter. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Wouter Adding from uh, Naturalis Biodiversity Center in uh, Leiden, the Netherlands. Um, I'm responsible for um, the technical uh, developments of uh, the DISCO research infrastructure, uh, which is an new uh, research infrastructure that we are building in Europe for uh, natural science collections. Um, as such, um, I am um, uh, uh, chairing uh, the technical team uh, for DISCO and I'm also um, leading um, uh, the, um, um, the stream in the DISCO Prepare project, which is an EU funded uh, project for um, uh, technology and, uh, and science. Uh, I'm also um, the European representative in the TEDVIC executive, and I'm uh, one of the co-chairs for a group for biodiversity uh, data integration in uh, RDA. And last not, not, uh, but not least, I'm also um, an, um, an ambassador for uh, GBIF. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Hello everyone. I see there's 100 and, oh, 105 of you. Uh, I'm from CNRI. Uh, those of you who don't know CNRI, it's a, a not-for-profit research institute. It was the uh, we mostly worked on information management on networks, uh, founded by the guys who came out of DARPA and did TCP/IP, and that seemed like the next logical thing to do. Um, it's the home of the handle system, which is now we've passed off to an international foundation based in Switzerland. We're also responsible for much of the software that's used in digital object architecture. Um, my, uh, I'm, I've managed or been involved in almost all of that over the years. Thank you. Thanks. Andrea? Hey there, um, I'm Andrea Thomer. I'm an assistant professor at the Uni University of Michigan School of Information. 
Um, but I do a lot of work with natural history data. So um, before moving into information science, I worked at the Library of Tar Pits and um, did a lot of work with our databases there. Right now, um, I'm involved in a couple of projects um, related to interests of this group. So one on database migration, where I did a bunch of case studies with Natural History Museum collections databases. Um, and I'm also working with an awesome group of people from across the University of Michigan, um, including Randy Singer, who I think is here, um, Hernan Lopez Fernandez, Karen Alofs, and Justin Schell, um, uh, where we're working with legacy data to try to integrate that with museum specimen data. So legacy data from fish surveys at a, um, uh, the Institute for Fisheries Research at Michigan. So basically interested in integrating legacy ecology data with specimen data. So. Thank you. Tim. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Falco, for inviting me to my first ever panel session. Uh, I'm Tim Robertson, and I work at the, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF. And I, I work in the informatics team there. I am the Tadwig Infrastructure Subcommittee Chair, and I participate in many Apache Software Foundation projects. Uh, the team that I work in at GBIF are responsible for the data infrastructure. So we, we have a, a global data infrastructure integrating uh, billions of your records that we mediate. Um, and that includes collection data from around about 900 uh, institutions from 100 countries. Um, I am not a biologist. I would consider myself an infrastructure engineer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now, uh, last but not least, I would um, hand over to um, Alex Hardesty, who will introduce himself and give a short overview of the two concepts um, in order to set the scene for the audience and the uh, upcoming discussion. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Falco, and thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and invitation to, to participate in this panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. So my name is Alex Hardesty, and I'm Director of Informatics Projects in the School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff University, which is in Wales, which is in the western part of the United Kingdom. Um, I first became involved in biodiversity informatics in 2003 when I came into contact with the Catalogue of Life as a, as, a, uh, as a member and leader of its design team. And since that, start, that time, I've been involved in many infrastructure developments, uh, looking at the next generation of informatics technologies to support biodiversity and environmental uh, informatics. Um, I have a, uh, a career background in IT engineering and, and telecommunications, but an educational background in environmental sciences and, and botany and ecology. So I'm able to close the loop between the two subjects. Although I know less, I think I probably know less about biology than I do about engineering. So there we are. Um, anyway, it's my pleasure today to, to give you a short introduction to, to this topic. And I'm just going to share my screen with you. Okay, can you see that? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and just move some things out of the way. Okay, okay so um, while I'm just spending 10 minutes uh, introducing these two concepts of extended specimens and digital specimens, uh, we're going to ask the, all the participants in this session to, uh, to vote on, or, or to say yes or no, on their familiarity with each of these two concepts. Um, if you look in your, the, uh, the bottom of your participants uh, list near the, uh, the virtual raise hand button, you will see a yes button and a, and a no button. And when I ask you to, I would like you to, to, to press one or, one or other of the buttons, depending on uh, how, how you wish to answer the question. Uh, and you'll be asked to do this twice. Okay. Um, okay, so. The, um, so the first topic that I'm going, well, the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, I think we all, or many of us uh, all know where this begins. Uh, it begins with the idea of the, the extended specimen as being um, 
a constellation of specimen and data types that in combination capture the multidimensional phenotype and genotype of an individual. And this is a concept that was put forward by Michael Webster in his, uh, I think, well-known book now, The Extended Specimen in, in 2017. And he talked about two aspects of extending specimens. He talked about the, the notion of extending the, uh, uh, the traditional physical specimen by using existing specimens in new ways or by new kinds of preparations and materials uh, gathered uh, for specimens. And he also talked about extending the scope of the specimen concept itself to, to include other things than biological or geological materials. Uh, such as things like audio and video and photographic uh, recordings and a wide range of other data types that, that can be either both directly derived from the specimen, like sequence information, for example, or indirectly related to the specimen, like habitat information, for example. And, 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 and it's this second uh, uh, element of the concept, which I think we're particularly uh, concerned with uh, now. Okay. Keep pressing the wrong button. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk first very briefly about the extended specimen concept. And at this moment, I would like to ask you how familiar are you already with the extended specimen concept? If you're, ex if you're familiar with it, press the yes button. If you're not familiar with it, press the no button. Um, this, this concept of the extended specimen uh, uh, as, uh, was, was, was taken up by the Biodiversity Collections Network in, in, the, in the USA uh, and developed uh, through the report that they produced about uh, extending US biodiversity collections to promote research and, and education. And this picture on the left is an extraction from, from that report. Uh, which, which shows how uh, they foresaw this, this, uh, this idea of Webster's extended specimen developing. Uh, they, 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 they see it as uh, having three uh, uh, elements to it, the primary extensions of, of the physical specimen, secondary extensions of the physical ex uh, specimen, and tertiary extensions of the, the physical specimen. And uh, as you move from the primary extensions through the secondary to the tertiary extensions, the, the information associated with this physical specimen becomes more indirectly related to it. And this idea then was taken up in, in the bioscience article that was uh, published at the beginning of this year uh, about the extended specimen network, a strategy to enhance US biodiversity collections, promote research and, and education, uh, which uh, remarks early on that in the last two decades, uh, we've witnessed a, a remarkable wave of digitization that has reshaped the collections paradigm to include digital data and, and infrastructure. And that this is bringing a whole host of new problems to, to, to collections and collection managers, because not only do they, they have to now manage physical collections, but they now have to manage the digital data that's being derived and associated with those physical collections. And in essence, uh, the extended specimen network idea places the extended specimen concept at the centre of what is uh, intended to be a national initiative to focus uh, uh, more directly on collecting digitisation, attribution, integration and attribution, uh, infrastructure and workforce and, and education. And as Andy already remarked in his in introductory uh, uh, introduction to himself, uh, you know, this has been uh, developed even further with the re recent National Academies report, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And there are already some real examples of the extended specimen concept in, in use. Here are three that I've, I've picked up uh, over the course of the last months. Uh, the New York Botanic Garden virtual herbarium uh, work on Appalachian uh, li lichens, which is reported in the same bioscience article I just mentioned. Uh, and his own work with the Specify uh, uh, Collection Management System at, at Kansas University Biodiversity Institute, where he manages fishes and has, uh, has, has done a lot of work on extending records in, in, in that collection with additional information. And one that I heard about this week, earlier this week, pre presented in one of the Tadwick symposiums by Catherine Levan from the uh, National Ecological Observatory Network Plant Monitoring Program, where they too also are adopting the, the extended specimen network. 
And I think it's fair to say that you know, we're at an early stage. Uh, these extended specimens have their origins in collection management systems, uh, but in, they remain quite difficult to find examples of and, and to access and, and follow all the links and, and, and reuse. And I certainly don't think they're very interoperable from, from, from one example to the next. Okay, I'm gonna turn now quickly to uh, digital specimens. Uh, and at this moment, I'm going to ask you uh, the same question again that I asked for extended specimens. How familiar are you already with the concept of digital specimens? If you're familiar with it, press your yes button. And if you're not familiar with the concept, please press the no button. Okay, so the digital specimens concept uh, has originated uh, on the other side of the Atlantic here in Europe uh, from the, the di DISCO initiative, the Distributed System of Scientific uh, Collections, where we see digital specimens as, as providing an anchoring function for, for all kinds of data that can be derived uh, from or indirectly associated with, with physical specimens. So in, in many sets, set, in many respects, there's a lot of uh, uh, similarity uh, with the, the notion of the extended specimen as well. We know that data locked up in these physical specimens can be released uh, through digitization uh, and through analytical and, and computational methods uh, and include a, a range of information as, as illustrated there on the screen. We see digital specimens as, as more though than just digital representations, uh, we see them as processable twins on the internet for the physical specimens that sit in collections. These digital objects, actionable knowledge objects on the internet can be manipulated remotely across the network by, by machines and, and humans. And I, and I want to draw your attention to, to this aspect of manipulation by machines because I think it's often understated and forgotten because typically, you know, we're much more familiar with humans working with specimens rather than, than machines. And digital objects and, and digital specimens as a, as a particular kind of digital object are fair by default, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Here's an example of one. Uh, many of you will have seen this before. I'm not going to dwell on it except to say um, but it can be uh, represented in some form such as, uh, as JSON and that uh, we have a proof of concept digital specimen repository that you can go and look at at nsidr.org. Um, I think an important thing about this, this representation of it as, as, as a fragment of JSON is that if you go to a lower level, then, then JSON as a, as a, as a string of, uh, of, of alphanumeric uh, characters is, is a kind of bit sequence. And, and, and this is important when it becomes, comes to technical and community alignment, because we see the work that we're doing on, on digital specimens as, as fitting into a, a larger ecosystem, a global ecosystem of work that's being driven by the, the work of the Research Data Alliance and by the FAIR guiding principles in which digital objects, uh, along with their, their persistent identifiers and, and the registration and resolution uh, systems for, for persistent identifiers and the repositories for, for these bit sequences make up digital object architecture. And, and I think this is important, certainly it's being driven in, in, in Europe by the, the, the policy work and the, the technical work in, in the European Open Science Cloud, where uh, together with the Research Data Alliance, uh, we're aiming to shape what we call a federated data, data fabric of fair digital objects for research data. If you want to follow the digital specimen work uh, further, you can go to our DISCO GitHub and find it there. So that's a very quick and very short introduction. I'll stop there. Thank you, Falco. Yeah, thanks, Alex, um, for this really nice summary and setting the scene for our discussions here. Um, be, before we start, um, I would um, also announce that I'm going to try to balance a little bit uh, between different aspects here in this discussion. Um, and um, this can also be seen in the shared document. Uh, so if you have questions, you might want to indicate whether uh, your question is more uh, regarding technological aspects or the scientific aspects or the user perspective. 
uh, or cr cross domain aspects. And these um, different categories, I will try to also um, highlight in, in uh, the following questions. But first of all, I would really like to uh, ask all the panelists just to say a few words about um, their personal vision regarding the concepts um, uh, of digital uh, specimens and extended specimens with special focus on the digital transformation of collection data and research. So um, is that the future? Do you see any challenges? Um, Larry, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I'll address it from a very generic point of view and then others can fill in the biodiversity aspect. So I think that a digital object approach or something much like it, and I could talk about that in more detail later, it will be essential to exploit, uh, fully exploit the digitization and linking that's going on now. Um, one, one, some time ago in RDA, we figured out that simply making data available is not sufficient. Uh, it, it, in fact, it can be uh, counterproductive if you, people don't really understand what the data is. This seems parallel to me. I mean, the, the digital digitization and linking is necessary, but not sufficient. Um, uh, except for some things, if, if you're just interested in following the link and give a human being the object at the end, then that's fine. But you're talking about billions of objects and we need the ability of autonomous software, not only to follow the links, but to know what to do with them when they get there. And I think it's a function of scale and efficiency and being able to do new stuff going further. Thank you. Um, yeah, if I can go next. So I'd really like to fire on for what Larry said. So um, I think, yeah, sort of dovetailing into some of those comments, I think the, the the visualization aspect of all this data, once we've got it all into a place where we can manage it, is going to be critical going forward. Um, it's going to be huge volumes of data and how we, we manipulate and view that as humans is going to be critical. But I'd also um, point to the input side of it because I think as we move more into a world of automation and uh, AI ML space, I think we're going to find we're going to have um, we're going to have specimens that are potentially purely described via a digital process that is not involved to human at all and, and how we handle that in this particular space is going to be very interesting or we're going to find that we're going to have digital only specimens where we may not have a single source or we've got a, a, a complex source such, such as metagenomics um, where we can't necessarily tie um, the data we have into a specific um, specimen, physical specimen. Thanks. Debbie, would you like to go next? Hi. Uh, following up on what's been said so far, a couple of things come to mind. I think the sheer size of the data sets points to, to Simon. We already know researchers are, oh my God, you know, this data set's bigger than any I've dealt with before. So there are going to be those important to work with the data in ways like in the cloud, if that's ever going to become increasingly important. Um, I think the Zen Cohen applies in the doing, we shall surely know that we are going to try different paths and we are going to learn from what we chose. Uh, and uh, a corollary to that would be a lesson that I can see from the British parliamentary papers. Um, many years ago, looking into those, I discovered, you know, historically the, the Brits chose a, a numeric numbering system for those documents. And of course, at some point it ceased to work and they have since been renumbered five times, historically speaking. So I think the message there is, this is gonna keep evolving as we try these new things. Okay, thanks. Bauta, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think traditionally we, we are used to um, work in um, individual collection management systems in, in individual institutions, um, kind of locked for, for people outside the institutions. And then we have a, a one way direction of, of publishing a subset of that data for public use. And um, I think we, we are hitting the limitations of, of that model and we need to change that. And I think that the digital specimen uh, model uh, enables to, to change that, that model um, and to allow um, to, um, to, 
to, to put the, the scientific data of the specimens in a public space uh, and have built in um, um, functions to uh, to put provenance for for people who collect collectively uh, then can start working on that uh, on that data and that means also that uh, it will be much easier to um, to get um, additional benefits of uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and and systems working on that data from uh, from external services Okay, thanks. Tim, from a from a data aggregator point of view. Uh, thank you. Um, hopefully I won't repeat what others have said. I didn't catch all of it. As, as you saw, the kids have just arrived home. Um, you, you asked if uh, how we uh, thought this would uh, um, come in the future. Um, it's exciting. And uh, I think we, we need to recognize that we're dealing with some complicated topics here. And I think we, we need to approach this, that it's really going to be a body of standards rather than a single standard. It's going to have to cover different areas of expertise, be it uh, the DNA handling or the image handling. And we should be looking to bring in many people into this process, so an inclusive process. Um, I think we've seen great success within the Tadwig and uh, wider community when many people can participate. We've got good subcommittees and uh, functional groups that have been able to work together and produce standards and mobilize a lot of data. Um, what is missing, I think, is the, the glue that brings these things together. And I think that's what Alex is getting at with the uh, digital specimen standards. It reminds me very much of work that we used to do in Tadwig many years ago with a core domain ontology. And I can see many aspects of, of what Tadwig used to do um, reflected in, in what uh, Alex is presenting now. So um, yeah, so to summarize, I think it, it is exciting. Um, I don't think we can approach this as a single standard, but we do need to, to think about how to integrate in a way that we can bring in as many people to, to help as possible. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Andy, what are your thoughts about it? So there's a, num there's a number of things here that occurred to me. The one is that, you know, as we digitize more of our information, we realize that we are, we are opening our data up to a much larger audience. There are a lot more people who are starting to use our data for all sorts of purposes that they were not originally intended to be used for, which is a good thing, obviously. The more we can get our collections used, the better off we are. Um, but I really think that the next big wave is integration, integrating all of this data together so that we can answer these big questions. Um, you know, without being able to integrate the different pieces together, it's very difficult for us to be, be able to answer those big questions and be able to sort of move forward in terms of the things that we can do with our collections. Um, integrating this data together also provides us with the necessary attribution that we need for our collections in order to keep, keep them going. Um, obviously, you know, the more we can integrate the data and when, the more we can show the products that are being created from our collections, the more we can advocate for our collections and show why they're important and what they're being used for. Um, it's also obviously advocating for the community. It's very difficult to advocate for our community because it is this huge distributed network of collections all over the world that are individually managed. And we can't sort of like the astronomical community, we can't point to the big telescope on the hill and say, that's what we use to do our research. And so being able to bring all of our collections together into a holistic sort of whole um, will benefit us as well as benefit the community um, you know, that is using our collections. We obviously need all of the, the necessary infrastructure to, to look after those collections, including the cyber infrastructure. And I think obviously the digital, the open digital specimen concept and the extended specimen network concept are the first attempts to try and bring all of this data together and make it and make it interoperable. Um, and I think everybody has a role to play. Um, you know, the collections have a role to play, the aggregators have a role to play, the end users have a role to play. Um, and you know, the, the, the glue that puts this all together is the goods. We've got to have identifiers on all of this stuff so that we can then bring it all together. And unfortunately, there, there, is, there is just too much, um, too many products of our collections that are being created without that necessary glue. 
without us being able to see that, see that those products are connected to our collections and make those connections to be able to bring it all together. And I think that's where this you know, open digital, digital specimen and extended specimen um, network concept will hopefully bring that all together um, and make that possible. Thanks, Andy. Andrea. Um, I, I actually totally agree with a lot of what Andy just said. So I'm following up on that. I think one of the biggest challenges with this is that, like he said, the distribution of people, of specimens, of data. Um, so all over the globe and in um, museums with varying levels of resources, repositories with varying levels of resources, lots of people don't have the, the physical time or the, just the people or the technical expertise to get some of this data mobilized in the way that it would need to be to be truly useful. So I think that's going to be a big challenge. And I think also one thing uh, with the curation of this data, um, it's, it's something that needs to be done constantly. They're also kind of distributed in time. And it's hard to keep those workflows going, um, again, especially for people that don't have the right resources that ideally they would have. Um, so I think uh, trying to tackle what are the different data curation and data preservation needs that are going to be um, necessary to uh, make sure that all of this data is usable over the long term is going to be something important and something that I think there's still a lot of question about, particularly as data get moved to different kinds of platforms and different kind of middle layers, as opposed to just staying on local servers, um, where we have a relatively decent idea of how to take care of them. Um, once things start getting out into the wild, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's, it's, it's much more hard to figure out how to track everything. I'm also seeing people in the chat talking about how we need GUIDs and unique identifiers for everything. And I would totally agree with that too. Basically everything needs an identifier and uh, that's easy to say and really hard to do and really hard to manage. So, and I know like Rod Page has talked about this a lot, um, but uh, yeah, lots of identifiers. And the last thing I'll say, I also saw Randy point this out in the chat, like um, tracking use of specimens is gonna be really important, but also giving credit to the people that are working on these specimens. I think that's gonna be big for uh, making sure that the work that goes into creating these uh, really vital resources is being acknowledged, understood, and, and then you know appreciated. Thanks, Andrea. And, um, I, I heard a lot of um, aspects um, already uh, that uh, we will maybe spend also some more time to, to discuss on. Um, I would like to um, uh, um, start with actually the scientific aspects, um, as this discussion might also already in the chat uh, tend to uh, go into details that are more technical. I would really like to, to address the the scientific aspects here um, um, as a beginning. And so um, I would like uh, to um, ask you, Bauta, um, the, the digital specimens and um, extended specimen concepts are more focused um, on the specimens being research objects, but the um, traditional collection management systems and related tools are actually um, more focused on the on the traditional um, workflows in the collections. So do you see any uh, conflict in, in uh, uh, building this more research object oriented uh, um, um, focus into systems and tools um, for digital objects and um, uh, for, for um, digital specimens and extended specimens? Uh, I, I don't really see a conflict. Um, I do see that um, uh, we may need to make a, a better separation between um, what is actually asset management, so, so management of the, the items in the collection, and um, the scientific data that comes with, with the specimens, the, the label data. And currently that separation is, uh, is not there in uh, collection management systems. And what you often see is that collection management systems are not only used by the, the curators, uh, by the collection managers, but also by, by scientists. And they evolve over time in uh, adding uh, functionality that is primarily uh, used for these researchers. And that makes these, these systems um, uh, very complex. And I think it would be better to, to, to separate these, uh, these two things. Yeah, thanks. Any, any comments from the panel? 
to this or um, additional answers to the question on potential conflicts. Otherwise, I would also invite uh, the audience here to uh, raise your questions to the panel and we will try to cover them here. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question from David Shorthouse in the chat. He says that uh, Andy touches on attribution for, for generation of nodes in the graph. How necessary might it be to also model attribution for the generation of the edges or the links? Could this incentivize deeper or more functional collaboration? Yeah, I think that's I think that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, th I, th I think it's I think if we could incentivize making those linkages, um, it would certainly it would certainly help. Um, you know, I think the, the part of the problem that I'm seeing is that a lot of the people who are using our collections, researchers and others, are not collections advocacy aware. And so they don't understand the necessity of creating those linkages in the publications that they're creating in the gen bank sequences that they're creating. You know, I've literally, I've literally spent hundreds and hundreds of hours trolling gen bank and trolling the literature, trying to find all of the publications in gen bank sequences that cite information from our collections. Um, and it is a hugely time consuming process. And sometimes those linkages just cannot be made because the researchers have not done a good enough job of linking the voucher specimen back to the, the publication or linking the tissue specimen back to the gen bank sequence. And I think what we need to do is we need to make the community more collections advocacy aware and make them understand the necessity of them providing those linkages in those, in those, those publications and gen bank sequences that they're creating so that it's easier for us to be able to create those linkages, either human mediated or computer mediated. I ask a question of Andy there, please. Uh, Andy, I've heard you talk about this several times, um, and I'm curious where you actually store the results of your findings. So you go trawling GenBank and Bold and others to find these links, but where do you actually um, record the results? Is it in Specify? Yeah, so, I, so there's a couple of things that I do. The one is that um, I record all of the citations and the GenBank sequences in Specify, and those are all published to the aggregators. Um, so you know, all of the publications and all of the gen bank sequences that are associated with vouchers or tissues um, are put into specify in the respective tables. There are tables that handle citations and gen bank information. Um, and, there's, and then those are published to the aggregators. The other thing that I've done is I've created a Google Scholar profile for our collection um, into which I've put all of the publications that cite information from our collection. Um, and that's a great tool to be able to advocate for your collection to show things like H indexes for your collection, et cetera. Um, in order to be able to advocate for how your collection is being used. So there's a number of, a number of things that, you know, processes that I use, but the, you know, the main one is, is actually putting that information into Specify and linking it up to the occurrence record and then publishing that out to the aggregators. And there's numerous benefits to that. Obviously, the one is the, is the, whole, the whole integration and attribution aspect. Um, but for GenBank sequences, the other one is obviously our tissues are non-renewable non resources. And so if you can publish all of those GenBank sequences associated with a tissue, you can stop somebody from re reusing that tissue over and over again to create the same sequence. Um, and so it, it, it does have numerous benefits. So, so the reason I ask that is because it sounds like your challenge is finding the information, but once you've found it, you actually already have the object model into which to store it. And it makes me think that perhaps what we need to do is work on some practices that make it easier for you to find the information that you're looking to store. And it, I, I, I see a slight disconnect that perhaps we're looking for a new standard for digital specimens um, as an object model, but it sounds like you already have it. You just can't populate the model um, with information. Well, part of, you know, the other problem is the time consuming nature of this. You know, the, f the fact that it has taken hundreds and hundreds of hours of me going and looking for these things, it would be better if I didn't have to look for them. If there was a, you know, if there was some process in place that if, a, if an object in GenBank had an identifier and that same identifier or some similar identifier was in my collection, that it would automate the process of making that link for me. And I didn't have to go and search for it. You know, I, I'm all about integration rather than duplication. Um, you know, and so you don't want to duplicate all of the information in GenBank that's already found in my collection management system associated with the tissue. 
You just want to make the linkage between the two. You want to be able to link the gen bank sequence to the tissue so that you can then um, extend the specimen and make it more useful to, to a wider group of people. Andrea, it looked like you wanted to comment that. Um, I wanted to point to, so I'm involved in a couple of earth science informatics projects as well. So I, I don't know if anybody here has heard of the throughput project, um, which Simon Goring at, uh, at Milwaukee, University of Wisconsin. Um, anyway, Simon Goring is the PI of this. I'll put a link to it in the chat. But the idea with the throughput project, and I'm a collaborator on this now, but I only just got added, so I might not explain it super well. But um, the idea is that uh, they're creating an annotation database to record linkages between these distributed resources. So say you've got a paper in Pangea or something like that, and then a physical sample in some other repository. The throughput database is storing this graph of annotations linking the fact that there is a paper and there is a sample together and using that as a middle layer that people can query to find networks of resources. So one plan I had had for this project was actually to start reaching out to people in the collections community to try to like try to get that information, Andy, like you're describing of like um, uh, tissue samples, sequence data and specimens into this throughput database as well, because um, one of the advantages of using this sort of system is that it starts breaking the disciplinary silos that sometimes separate um, extended resources about other uh, about the specimens. So if like a, if, if a specimens were used in an ecological or even um, geological sort of study, you're not going to it's going to be harder to find them in domain siloed sorts of databases. So um, I don't know, I just wanted to point to that as like a parallel effort going on in the earth science community that might be of interest to people. Um. Thanks, that's that's really interesting. I also would like to take this one step further. Um, so I see that um, there, the linkage um, between the research outcomes uh, with citations in the collection management systems and other uh, databases are really important. But what's all about the enriched digital twins of our collection objects, how to how would we sync actually the digital information that is enriched in cyberspace uh, to our digital objects? So any thoughts on that? Maybe uh, Simon, do you have any ideas on that? Oh uh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> getting the information back into your systems based on on other people's interpretation of that information or usage of that information is is critical and you know um that kind of data it's it's not just getting that data back it's how you handle that data when you do get it back because if there's a tsunami of that data that comes into the collections who's going to be responsible for vetting that data as your um update your data being that that's the data that should be the source of truth um i think longer term the the way we need to be looking at that is to automate it as best we possibly can and, and have that process streamlined as possible much as possible um that that's from my point of view like i said i'm not a i'm not a scientist i don't really understand a lot of the technical side uh, the the scientific side of it but from a technical point of view it, it's how we we streamline that process to ensure that where those changes are being made, they're being fed back to the, the source institution to update that data to be um, reflected in their data before it gets re, um, reset out to the aggregators. Yeah, thanks. Anyone okay, else? I'd like to I'd like to comment on that briefly, if you don't mind. Just so uh, I I think that sounds right, and I I think a lot of what we've been talking about, uh, an important aspect of a lot of what we've been talking about is workflow. Uh, there's uh, the group of people I work with on some digital object architecture aspects are are focused now on workflow, as a way to begin to introduce um, these concepts into into science. I mean standards are great for science and and but scientists themselves it's a big lot of trouble um so we need to uh, make it easy for this stuff to happen and by introducing workflow tools that that push the the uh, extension uh, of these th these ideas back as far as possible to the original uh, work by the scientists is probably an important aspect 
Thanks. Deb, you wanted to comment that? Yes, I just wanted to add a, a layer to this conversation, which is, um, and some people here, we've had some private conversations about this topic, this notion of a digital collection being added to the physical collection and having to manage uh, both of them. Uh, if you take it to the leadership level and you think about a museum and who's uh, administrating that museum, the directors, um, they have to have or need support this sort of data and technology leadership. Depending on the museum, as, as Andrea pointed out, their levels of support differ. And this also means their levels of what they know they need or to ask for vary. And so there's a, a great need for sort of data and technology leadership, I think, at the museums. And people uh, in the ADBC program that I've talked to uh, can share uh, at some point how different 10 years with uh, have brought for them in what they know now about what to ask for, what to plan for, what they're going to need. Um, and so there's, we're talking a lot about the implementations, but I'm talking about this notion of helping the museum uh, go forward in the future and helping hold their hand through that process if they don't have that data and technology leadership yet. Yeah, thanks. Any more comments on that? Otherwise, I would like to uh, just check whether there are questions from the audience on, on the uh, aspect of scientific use for research. Any questions on that? Well, while, while you're looking, can I ask Deb a question, please, on what she said? Please go ahead. Well, when you talk to uh, the, the leadership in the institutions, Deb, um, who, who is expected to, to manage the records, the digital records or the digital objects? Um, because I understand from, from some of the discussions, we're talking about opening up uh, editing rights to external people. Mm -hmm. And I'm, one, I'm wondering what kind of comfort level there is in institutions for, to, to allow that. Is it seen as great, we're going to save lots of money because we're going to crowdsource this? Or is it seen as a concern and possible reputational damage because other people can edit your primary data? I, I don't work in one of these institutions, but it, right. it's something I'm interested in. Well, let's ask the group here, how many of you would love to uh, curate your people data publicly so that everybody can help you make your people data better? Can, you can put a plus one in the chat if you're like that, I guess, or you can vote yes. How about that? And no, if you would, don't want to do that. Use the yes, no yeah. votes. I changed my mind. Yeah, yeah. please use the yes yeah, There and you no go. Votes, Thank you. So. Getting used to that. Uh, yeah. yeah, so- I'd also so, say- I'm, I'm sorry, go, go. ahead, I was, I was just going to say, I'd also add to that, Tim, I think that there's an additional part to that, which is about um, there'll be different institutions or different providers that will have different levels of trust attached to them. So institution to institution might be a different conversation versus citizen science to institution, for example. Yeah, so uh, Tim, my experience has been that we're still finding this out because it's just now in the realm of possibility with some of the tools like Bionomia that David Shorthouse has built that people had, it's this thing you've heard me talk about many times where because he's made it possible for us to see the potential in that by building that tool, then people are like, oh yes, this is great. So. And then I see there is there is a question that uh, um, might fit also uh, uh, nicely into this uh, scientific uh, topic. Um, a question by Matt Yoda. The earth science biodiversity is vast. Uh, a vast majority of specimens and uh, their phenotypes will be studied, studied once and never again. Given this, uh, are we overemphasized the quantity and quality of feedback we might have to ingest if we have a nice uh, data, for example, annotation, corrections, etc., exchange format or tools? Is this driving us to create a very complex architecture that won't be used? This is a nice transition, actually, to the technological aspects we definitely need to discuss in this discussion as well. Any takers? Yeah, I think that's a good point. <laughs> um, um, so someone at UMMZ, I think Corey Thompson has talked about um, maybe, so one way to start might just look at, look for super specimens. So specimens that have been highly cited, highly used. 
Um, and that strikes me as a, a smart approach. Um, one thing my, my former advisor, Carol Palmer, used to say all the time was that curation happens through use. And so one way to scope and scale your efforts is to focus just on what's being used. So that might mean looking for those, those specimens that are being highly cited and that have been highly important for, for whatever reason. Or it could mean, I think working on the things that are being worked on is also a good approach. So that could indeed mean the, the, that one organism or phenotype or something that's only gonna be studied once, but the hope would be that the infrastructure that you build for that um, would be useful for similar situations. I don't know if I'm misunderstanding that um, sort of suggestion though. Yeah, and can I, can I offer a counterpoint to that? I, I don't necessarily disagree with it, but I think there is another perspective, which is to say that you know, according to traditional modes of working and, and historic practice with, with specimens, uh, you know, that view might be true. But what happens when you have digital data for, for 3 billion specimens available to you? What new things might you suddenly start to do by applying a computer to all of that data? which means the specimens might become studied many, many, many times. Yeah, that's also a good point. Any other comments on that? Um, I'd probably just add one more. I think when we're talking about more traditional annotations, if we put, put aside the fact that, you know, we might have machines going over these billions of, of specimens over time and, and, and looking at that data. But if we go back to the traditional ways we get annotations into our systems through some of the aggregators, um, the things that, that I've noticed in our institution is that trying to keep up with those annotations and who does the, the vetting of those is a real issue and a real problem. There's one thing to say, we need a framework in order for those annotations to be captured and sent back. But in the end, how, how are we going to handle those? If they're coming back in even, you know, in hundreds of, uh, of annotations a week, which for a big institution may not be too many in compar comparison to the amount of specimens they have available for out, out in the world digitally, it's still someone at some point in time has to sit down and look at those and, and vet whether or not they're, they're real and who does that. And, you know, we can look at some of the comments there, you know, is it a, a global community that, that does it in a similar way to, to Wiki where, you know, consensus rules, but are home institutions going to, to go with that because everyone has their own particular bent on what the, the data is and what it should be based on their um, interpretations. So. Alex, yes. I, mean, I, I think that's an interesting point, Simon. Um, I was in a separate, dis completely separate discussion yesterday where there was uh, representatives from different parts of the heritage sector, and specifically the, the fine art world. And one of the questions that, that they asked was, what are you doing about capturing the argumentation? And, and I didn't understand the need for that origin, uh, initially until I started to think about what actually happens in the art world when we ask ourselves questions like, is this painting really painted by Michelangelo or was it one of his students? Is this painting a fake one or is it a real one? And we all know that uh, experts can't agree on the answers to, to some of those questions. Is there value uh, in being able to uh, you know, not only capture the annotations, the different opinions that, that, that people have around specimens and, and the data from specimens, but also to be able to capture uh, argumentation as a branch of computer science and, and, and apply uh, computing techniques to that? Is that what we enable? Yeah, I think one of the ways in which we can do that is by changing, changing the publication model that we currently have. So the way that we publish our data, we publish it as a snapshot, whereas I think we need to get around to publishing more as a transactional kind of deal where, you know, everything would be a transaction. And so you could get, you could get at this multiple annotation kind of idea um, through a transactional, um, a transactional publishing mechanism where somebody could look at a specimen and they could say, I think it's this. Somebody else could look at that same specimen and say, no, I think it's this. Those are just transactions on that specimen and you could keep track of all of those transactions at the same time. 
Um, and so, you know, very much looking at a, you know, and I, I keep going back to this blockchain idea of a, a blockchain kind of idea where you have all of these, all of these transactions that are linking things together, whether you are, you know, loaning a specimen from one organization to another, that's simply a transaction on that specimen. And that would, that would enable us to be able to do things like, um, you know, comply with Nagoya protocol. Um, the same thing with annotations, the same thing with determinations, the same thing with, you know, georeferencing. All of those things are just transactions on a specimen. And so I think what we need to do is we need to, we need to and it's, it's not an easy ask, I realize that, but I think we need to get around to having a, a more transactional system of, of publishing our data rather than a, a snapshot in time. Yeah, I thought Tim was going to have something to say about that. Yeah, but maybe let me just <laughs> let me just uh, add another question to that. And uh, Tim, this is actually a question for you and maybe also uh, Larry. Um, so maybe you can directly uh, take this into account. Um, in order to go more into the technical details, what uh, Andy just uh, uh, described is uh, really um, a um, a nice vision, but um, the collection management systems are actually, um, uh, in most cases, relational databases. Do we need something different here? Um, and do the um, systems also for the for the aggregators need to change in order to be able to do that? And Tim, so please just comment on Andy's answer, and maybe you can um, also answer this. <laughs> I'll do what I I'll do what I can. <laughs> so, um, firstly, I, I feel partially responsible for the fact that we publish as snapshots. Um, around about 15 years ago, uh, I started what is now known as the Darwin Core Archive format, which is widely used in the community. And when we were designing that, we had many discussions with the collections community. And we did look at individual record um, transfer models, which is what you're describing here, record by record transactions. And every single um, CMS that we talked to said, internally, we don't manage our data like that. What we do is we do things like we'll refresh our entire taxonomic tables in one go and we'll update the new taxonomy and we're unable to tell you which records that's affected. So they weren't internally, they weren't even able to provide which records have been changed when they apply these data management techniques. And there was also concern with load on institutional databases and the inefficiencies of all of the, the queries that were going on. And that's what led us to the idea of snapshots and version snapshots and what's evolved into DOI based snapshots of data sets. Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't revisit that, um, that uh, decision. And this Alex and, and the DOI um, architecture give very good reasons why we should be um, rethinking this. But I think I would have to ask the CMS developers again, what has changed in the last 15 years that makes this now possible? Um, and are you ready to move to a record by record synchronization model? So one of the things that I can say is that Specify has just implemented an audit log in the CMS. Um, that you can actually get to through an API. Um, and so you would be able to see record by record level changes on every single record. Um, you know, how granular that is and how it would actually function in terms of resolving this, I don't know. Um, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. Thank you. And so there was one other point was people did say that they generally corrected and uh, fixed up data on mass. They didn't often work on record by record level corrections. So it was actually pulling large subsets of, of data across the internet. So we, we built a format to accommodate that. Sorry, Larry. Yeah, I can comment more generally that uh, in transition from uh, existing systems to new capabilities, you you've always almost always will need some sort of transition path. So um, I had to do a slide for the IGSN folks uh, some weeks ago, and what I showed was the, um, the the approach that we're working with on Disco. What you have at the bottom is the current systems, and down from there are the current services. You can't get rid of the current services, but you build on top of that, and you begin to expose the data in a in another fashion. 
Uh, this is, you know, the internet was built to connect networks. They didn't, the networks didn't go away. You just put routers in between the networks to make them work together. Uh, that's the same sort of thing. You, you need to take existing systems and have a new outward um, uh, approach to where they can connect to each other, but you can't kill the existing stuff or change it on some flag day sometime. So I would have um, a follow-up question on that. Um, so um, it was mentioned before that um, the, the identifiers are actually the glue be between all those different things. So what do you think uh, for especially the collection management systems and, and other tools uh, for collection management and related uh, research tools? Um, where should the data live actually? I mean, if everything is connected with everything, um, what would you think um, on the implementation level, how, how that would uh, work? And again, the question I raised before, how to synchronize these, these things from a technical point of view. So I'll, I'll start with something very high level, which is I don't, I don't want to care where, it's, where the data actually is. Um, so it has to actually be somewhere. There are some bits in the universe somewhere, uh, but we want to be able to move them and change them. One of the things that attracted me to this community in the first place, and I was a writ before I fell in with you know all crazy computing stuff, I was trained as a librarian. One of the things that appeals to me about this community is the is the emphasis on the long term. You guys have been keeping this, this stuff available and in good order for centuries. And I presume you hope that will continue for centuries. No one can tell you what the computing environment will look like in 50 years to say nothing of 100 years. So you, you have to describe this stuff in terms of functionality. So the, you want identifiers that are independent of the underlying technology so that they'll persist over time. And you want the definition and functions of those specimen objects to be independent of technology because it will change. It, it, I, don't, I don't think the relational databases are very useful. They will be a footnote in someone's thesis 50 years from now. And God, God knows what we'll be using it at, in 50 years or 100 years. So you have to begin by thinking about the highest levels of abstraction you can wrap your mind around. And then of course you have to implement that. There are lots of engineering questions and implementation questions to make things scale. Uh, but you have to start by thinking as abstractly as possible. Okay, if, if there is another quick answer on this, otherwise I would take the opportunity. Um, yeah, Wouter, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I agree that um, as a user, um, I would not like to, to, to mind where the data is. Although I would like to have it um, be to be as close as possible to where I do my calculations. Um, because the, the size of data is, is, uh, is growing continuously. And um, I think we should uh, take measurements that we uh, do not need to move around uh, all the data all the time. Um, and I think another uh, issue is, is trust. So um, I need to, to the data to be in the place that I can trust, that I can access it, and that I can access it in a form that I know that it is untampered with. Um, so these are things that are important for me as a user. Can I just add to that and, and, and yes, say please. that I, I, I agree with what Bauta says? Um, the first thing that he says is that he wants his data to be close to where he does his calculations. But that should not be interpreted to mean that he wants to do his calculations close to where he is. Uh, it's perfectly possible that he can move his calculations to where the data should be. Yeah, uh, thanks. By, by, for example, remote operations. And for me, it seems that, Wouter, you just uh, read my mind, um, because this is a perfect uh, transition in terms of also uh, um, of the time uh, constraints we have. I would really like now to uh, address a little bit more the user perspective. Um, and maybe um, it's, it's a question for, for you, Andrea, um, but then also to the others. Um, what do you expect 
will have to change from a user perspective um, to the existing uh, systems and tools. I mean, uh, Larry just mentioned, uh, we might want to keep this as uh, um, uh, abstract as possible, but in practice, this is really complicated. If, if we have our end users of systems, we might want to um, um, keep things as simple as possible for them um, in terms of usability um, and user-friendly uh, user interfaces and so on. So what are your thoughts about this? Well, for one thing, I would point out that there's a couple different user groups that we need to think about. And one that I think often gets forgotten is the collections managers and the other, um, the curators of these materials that are honestly, more often than not, the ones using these systems much more than just like random scientists out there. So I, I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done supporting that user community so that they can in turn support the research user community. Um, and some of that is going to be around giving them the ability to link together those disparate resources. So I know like, like Specify has the ability to add in links to other, um, you know, other unique identifiers and things like that, I believe. I think continuing to explore what sort of, um, yeah, so what, what kind of linkages are necessary and also um, doing user studies with that group to see how they're working with their systems. So from my work talking to Natural History Museum collections managers who are wrangling their databases, they're doing a awesome job <laughs> of making everything work, but they are often having to be really, really creative in coming up with their own ad hoc solutions to things. So lots and lots of, you know, very creatively made spreadsheets and it's very vindicating to see people clapping to this. Um, but like, yeah, so like um, really creative use of spreadsheets, really creative approaches to things. And, and a lot of them are totally, like I, I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to that are using systems that were technically deprecated in 1998. Like people querying Fox Pro databases with an R script, which is extremely creative, so smart, and not something they should necessarily have to do. So I, I, I would like to see more development on that. And then I think that would help work with like research scientists working with that data. This is a rant I go on a lot as you could probably tell. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Deb was first um, and then the others can. Thanks. Um, and I'd like to add a, a bullet point to what Andrea said. So to give you some perspective from the, the IT point of view, um, 10 years ago, in an ADBC IDIG bio meeting somewhere that included uh, distributed groups like this. I asked for why can't we have more visualization inside collection management systems so that collection managers can understand their data visually and interact with it a bit more rather than having to figure out how to query it or be, see what's inside all those buckets in a more effective way. Um, I was told that visualization was for researchers and the collection managers need no such thing. So I think we've had an evolution there and that um, collection managers are now able to speak up and have a voice and have this experience. And um, I think IT has evolved at the same time and understood that collection managers need more than rows and columns in a relational database uh, to help them manage their data. Yeah, thanks. I just had the feeling that Simon or Tim, you wanted to also say something. Yeah, Simon? I was just going to sort of um, sort of follow on from Andrew's point, which is to say that that globally we face the fact that the the technological maturity of the collections is different, vastly different across the various different um, communities in which we operate, and um, solutions that we provide might suit some of the more advanced ones but in the end the the lower technology uh communities might struggle with some of this and it's, it's how we simplify this and and whether we provide a, a global solution to this outside of some of the collections um systems that exist via a simple link to somewhere so like a, a global annotation service for example rather than having to have each collection management system handle annotations internally um themselves um is is a really important thing but um certainly just anecdotally 
you know, when I see the users in there in CSIRO um, using the systems, it's all about how we make it as simple as possible for them to see the data that they want. And this gets to Deb's point around how, how we present that data back to them. As this data grows and we get more and more information that we're trying to link to a, a individual specimens, um, the way we visualize it is going to become increasingly important. Yeah, Bauta. Yeah, uh, I think the, the model that we are currently having, uh, where we have uh, a collection uh, um, system in an institution, where the uh, the collection managers work together as as an institution uh, community, basically, is a bit odd, maybe, uh, because that means that you have your collection managers working in a herbarium and collection management working in an insect collection and in an alcohol collection, marine collection. Um, and they are not a logical community. So uh, what, what uh, would be possible if you have that, that model of digital specimens is if you have all these, these data in the clouds that you could have a model like Symbiota where you form new communities where you can have all the, the collection management uh, collection managers uh, working on uh, herbaria material, working together on the material. I think, um, so I think that would be very nice new uh, opportunities for, for users to work with the data. Yeah, um, thanks Vauta. Um, actually, I think it was Vincent Smith uh, in his talk in the symposium four on um, on um, Wednesday, mentioning the the fun at work for especially collection stuff, um, and so um, Andy, do you see um, that in the near future we could actually make this work um, more fun, even though if there is a very high pace in the development from a technical point of view? which is in, in most uh, cases more a, a burden than fun for, for the end users. I don't know, I find my, I, I find my job a lot of fun, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know whether, whether, that trans, whether that translates across to collections management as well as it does you know, in, in something like iNaturalist. Um, I think it's a difficult. I think it's a difficult concept to get around. Um, I don't know. There's not much more that I can that I can say than that. Um, okay, thanks. No problem, Deb. Um, yes, I think so. Um, I think it's the notion of working together in the collection. With I can't read this label. Do you know what this abbreviation is? And then all of a sudden, you have the world at your fingertips. There's herbarium junkies on Facebook. There's the Ento translator on Twitter. There are these microcosms where people are creating these networks that they can help get that data faster. And, and so if we can build a network that allows you to get that information more quickly, we're currently uh, geo-referencing and we have a Slack channel. Well, now all of a sudden we're distributed. And when you have a question, you can ask the Slack channel. And instead of having your neighbor or nobody to ask where a locality is, you now have 25 people who can help you find something. Uh, so I think we can um, amplify that effort depending on how we build these systems. So that could be fun in the sense that easier to find things, easier to connect things, easier to inherit things if somebody's already got data for a particular object, like a collector. Yeah, thanks. Andrea? Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. Somebody in the chat mentioned uh, asked, can we make collections management as fun as using iNaturalist or something like that? And which I think is a fun, I, I like that idea as a goal. Um, and one of the nice parts about like iNaturalist and the C gap is that you do have that, like, um, you know, machine learning and stuff like that helping you with the identifications, getting you to where you're going. But then you're encouraged to do the rest of the work yourself. I think playing around with things like that. And, and, and it's really satisfying to add to that network and, and like seeing how we can add to that satisfaction of making your data beautiful um, might be a, a great thing to explore. Tim? Um, no, I, I was just thinking that the, I, I'm an INAT user, but a, a casual one. The, the iNatural data model is relatively simple. 
and I understand that there's there's much more rigor in some of the science that goes on on specimens. And I'm curious which parts of specimen research you think would lend themselves well to community and crowdsourced activities, things like georeferencing, perhaps identifying, transcribing labels, I could imagine would work well. Um, what what other aspects of, of the, the work around specimens do you see as as being suitable for, for fun, engaging gamification type activities? Any takers? We're getting answers on chat. Okay. So um, the the chat is is really active at this stage. I, I can say that uh, we will definitely um, save all these uh, questions that have not been answered yet, or uh, your comments, your ideas, and continue the discussion um, um, even after our session in a, a slightly different format. I will maybe say a few more sentences on that um, as well. So if there is from the panel no direct answer to this, this is something we will definitely take yeah that you you have an well, answer i think me. in the chat I, and i have too it's hard to follow all of this at the same time but, same it's for me, fun. Yeah. but it is fun um somebody did add their thought that for example bionomia is fun and and i have to say i know there are people that are contributing to that and find it very fruitful and we're trying now in this georeferencing project to show eventually eventually that we could find a geolocations by knowing more about the person like if we know who collected it we can go and look in bionomia and see where they were in 1952 and we can inherit that georeference so uh, potentially right this is this is ways in which we could make it more fun and fun in the sense that it's more productive because you can find what you need faster so if you want to gamify that tim i it, it, that's so hard because it's motivation different people are motivated differently um like i i don't care i have the many i like to find something I just like to do the finding. So, um, but some people would, might get into that and we could get other people to help us. I would, I would counter that. I think it has more to do with metrics than it does, than it has to do with fun. Mm. I think a lot of people are very engaged in metrics. You know, how many of, how many of this have you done or how many of this have you done or how many specimens have you cataloged or sure. how many things have you georeferenced or, mm. you know, so some sort of, some sort of engagement to be able to show somebody's contribution, much like Bionomia in a collection management system that would show, you know, if you have a student working in your collection, how many records they've cataloged, how many they've edited, um, how many they've georeferenced, um, how many images they've attached to specimens, how many images they've taken, those kinds of things, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of metrics would be a fun way to engage more people in, in collection management. Um, you know, I think in most cases, collection managers are up to their eyeballs and stuff already. They don't need any more tasks to take on. Right. Uh, so giving them some sort of some sort of indication of the tasks that they're already doing um, and giving them a, an indication of the metrics that they're generating would be a would be a great way of being able to incentivize people or be able to provide them with some sort of metrics to show, you know, show their productivity. Yeah, my, my point was just that motivation is individual. So not in a gamification scenario, not everything will motivate, but those metrics will really motivate administrators. They they want those for sure. Well, then it'll motivate the collection managers as well. Okay. Thanks. Being aware of the time, I actually um, would like to um, raise a question um, for all of you and I would also again like to um, would like to ask you to um, just briefly answer that um, um, and every one of you um, that would be nice um, from this very I think very short amount of time that we have to discuss that um, actually I see we need to continue the discussion. So what would uh, be the, the most important next steps for you? Just in a few words that uh, the community, we all 
both the domain specific uh, um, experts and uh, the technical people, the, the vendors of uh, systems and tools, um, which next steps should we uh, um, take or focus on in the near future? Alex, would you like to start? Okay. Um, I think I would like to hark back to uh, a, a, a remark that Tim made uh, right right near the, the, the beginning when he, when he said, uh, it's probably not one standard that we need here, but probably a, a portfolio of standards. Um, and that may or may not be right, I don't know, but it, it, it's undoubtedly the case that Tadwerk is working on a portfolio of standards. Uh, and uh, we need to organize ourselves around this common vision uh, that's going to support and drive this portfolio of standards before, because if we don't organize ourselves, we're going to uh, uh, proceed in a fragmented way, which is not going to lead us to the goals that we need. So I would say the first thing is, the next step is to organize, our, organize ourselves better around the vision. In parallel with standards work, of course, you need reference implementations where you can learn and, and gain experience, which is going to uh, you know, drive the direction in which those standards go. Uh, and I think that's another another area that we need to think about how we're going to work on more effectively. I'll throw in a I'll throw in a cliche, which is rough consensus and running code. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's taking what Alex said and, and sort of taking these standards and it's a very practical step for me, which is to take those standards back to where we're capturing our information and ensuring that we're, we're getting all those links captured appropriately and, and, and documented appropriately. Thank you. Andrea? Um, I'd like to see some prototypes and pilot projects, um, take a small collection or a subset of a collection and document the extended set specimen to the best your, of your ability and then see what you can do. Um, I think, I, I don't know, this might be what I'm harping on for today, but like use and understanding the realities of use is really important for to accompany standards. How are the standards being enacted? and what kinds of new uses of the data are they facilitating and what changes might we need to make in order to facilitate what people really want to be doing. Thanks. Bota? Yeah, I would say uh, identify some fun and I don't know if you can marry these two concepts but I think um, all the, the, the piloting that we want to do starts with being able to properly uh, identify uh, the things. So. It all starts with, uh, with uh, adding identifiers, but uh, as soon as we have that, um, I think um, the, the most important thing is that every pilot we build and every uh, small uh, service that we build should be fun and, and should um, give people the incentive. To, to want more. Otto, I, I think we had some technical issues on your side. Um, could you repeat the last sentence or am I the only one? Yes, um, I, I think that, that um, all the things that we start building, all the piloting that we do, um, need to have a, a fun uh, component uh, in them so that, uh, that people um, who, who are trying them out want one more, actually. I think that's, Thanks. that's key. Thanks. Tim? So I agree very much with, with what Alex said, so I won't repeat that, but uh, I think a, an obvious next step here would be to look at what Andy's doing. He's someone who is building his extended specimen objects manually, and he says it's very painful to do that. I, I would like to understand how he's, he's doing it and start looking from an engineering aspect of what we can do to make that easier and start delivering him data feeds that he can load in and spend less time uh, troweling the web for, for links. Thanks. Andy. That would be awesome. Did you say me? I didn't. 
I, I said Andy. Sorry. Andy. Oh, sorry, sir. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Alex said. Um, and you know, I think we need to we need to congeal around some of these initiatives that are already ongoing. Um, you know, there's a number of there's a number of pieces of this puzzle that are starting to come into place. Um, like the IGSN stuff that's being worked on for, for resolving identifiers um, and the open DS stuff that, that Alex is working on and the extended specimen stuff that we're working on. You know, I think we just need to congeal around these, these, these components that are, that are starting to um, come together to make up the whole and then figure out where the gaps are, figure out where the gaps are that we need to fill and what we need to fill them with. Um, and, you know, I know for one that the, the Biodiversity Collections Network is planning a, a bunch of workshops coming up soon um, that will be looking at these sort of five pillars as we've, as we've identified them of the, of the extended specimen network concept um, of collecting, digitization, integration, infrastructure, both physical and, and cyber, and then workforce and education. Um, and so I think you know that that'll be a good step in terms of congealing the community around these concepts and trying to get people all pointing in the same direction and working towards a common goal. Thanks. And Deb. I I think yay what everybody said. Um, I would like to say in implementing these, keeping an eye on what the skills needs are that we are asking people to have and figuring out ways in which we might address those together as well. Rather than piecemeal, rather than collection institution by institution, I'm sure everybody's systems are different. Everyone's going to say that sort of thing, but some of the skills indeed that are needed are the same. And figuring out how we can help museums form a network around that need could help them uh, with their capacity development and help them uh, community network better together. Um, and as I said at the beginning, in the doing of all of this, we will figure it out iteratively. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. And actually, we are at the end of our session. Um, there are lots of other questions um, from the participants. So um, I would really uh, continue this discussion. Um, in a separate space. And as I know, there are different communication uh, channels set up uh, by Tadwick. So my suggestion would be to really dig into more details. Um, uh, for example, um, on the um, Tadwick Discord or Slack channels, and um, we might come back to you um, with, um, a, with the links and um, um, just highlight where to continue this. Um, if you just sign up in the Google um, document that is linked in the chat, maybe my co-moderators can link it again. Um, please feel free to sign up at your email address and we will reach out uh, to you. So we can make sure all the questions and discussions um, uh, can be answered and continued. And um, at this point, I would really like to thank all the panelists. Uh, it was a great discussion, great topics, um, and, and great aspects uh, um, as an initiation of um, uh, tackling with all these challenges. Um, I would also like to thank my co-moderators and helpers and um, the whole Tadwick Organ organizers to make this conference uh, possible. Um, and of course, I would also like to thank all the participants being very active here in, in this session. Uh, thanks for your interest and questions and discussions.